Welcome to the Transform Your Mind to Transform Your Life radio show and podcast. I'm your host, Coach Myrna Young, and today is our third installment in our series, The Health is Wealth. Today our focus is on binging and overeating and how that negatively affects your health. My guest today is Dr. Glenn Livingston, author of Never Binge Again, and our topic is how to reprogram yourself to think like a permanently thin person. Welcome, Dr. Glenn. I am going to enjoy um, talking to you today because I am going to learn a few things myself. So welcome. I have been looking forward to this whole week. Thank you for having me. Uh, you're very welcome. All right, so let me give you a little bit more information about um, Glenn Livingston. Um, PhD is a veteran psychologist and was the longtime CEO of a multi-million dollar consulting firm which serviced several Fortune 500 clients in the food industry. Glenn has sold over $30 million of market, marketing consulting services over the course of his career. You may have seen his previous work, theories, and research in major periodicals like the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, the Chicago Sun Times, the Indiana Star-Ledger, the New York Daily News, American Demographics, or any of the other major media outlets. You may have also heard him on ABC, WGN, CBS Radio, or UPN TV. Disillusioned by what traditional psychology had to offer overweight and or food-obsessed individuals, Dr. Livingston spent several decades researching the nature of binging and overeating via his work with his own patients and a self-funded research program with more than 40,000 participants. Most important, however, however, was his own personal journey out of obesity and food prison to a normal, healthy weight and a much more lighthearted relationship with food. Awesome bio. So you've been around, and this is definitely your expertise. So um, I'd like to start off with some background information. So um, Dr. Glenn, can you tell us what makes you uniquely qualified to comment on eating disorders? And I guess you can tag on again um, why that made you write the book, Never Binge Again. Well, I'd be happy to. In a nutshell, (laughs) I'm not just a psychologist who wanted to work with people to help them lose weight I'm, or to correct the reading. I'm a guy who had a very serious eating problem myself. And I did a lot of consulting for uh, big food, big pharma, big advertising. And so I know what goes on there. I, I, know how they're, I know how they're engineering these hyper palatable concentrations of starch and sugar and fat and oil and excitotoxins and salt that are engineered to hit our bliss point without giving us a nutrition to help us feel satisfied. And I know how the advertising industry is beaming five to 7,000 messages a year at us over the internet and the airwaves, all about food, and maybe a half dozen of them are encouraging you to have more fruit and vegetables. And I know what's happening in the addiction treatment field that we're being told that we're powerless over the addiction, that it's a disease, that it's an irresistible impulse that gets worse over time. And um, without really having any scientific evidence of the same. And so, you know, I've, I've, it's been my life's mission. It's been my life's mission to figure it out for myself first and foremost. And then once I did to figure out how, um, how I can help a million people a year to stop overeating. Hmm. So that's, that's nice why I'm uniquely goal. qualified. I, <laughs> I could tell you more about my personal story if you want, but um, that's how I'm uniquely Please. qualified. Please. Yes. Yes. Tell us about your personal story. Um, you mentioned it in the bio that you, um, you, you know, you were once um, obese and had a food addiction. So yeah, tell us your story and how it, you know, how that story led to you for you to be um, spend decades, um, you know, working on this. Well, led me to spend decades out of necessity. <laughs> I was either going to spend dec- dec- decades 
figuring it out or having my um, head buried in the bottom of a box or a bag or a container. So, yeah, I, I was uh, I discovered a weird thing when I was a kid. I'm, I'm six four. I'm reasonably muscular, okay. and I figured out when I was about seventeen that if I worked out for two or three hours a day, that I could eat whatever I wanted to. So mm. boxes of muffins, boxes of donuts, boxes of pizza, um, boxes of chocolate bars. I really six, seven, eight thousand calories a day was no problem. Oh wow! And I mm. would, yeah. But it, it was okay because, I mean, it was okay with me because I, yeah, I spent a lot of time eating and recovering from eating, but I was thin and good looking and I, you know, enjoyed my adolescence very much. But when I got to be about 22 or 23 and I was married and I was in graduate school and I was commuting two hours each way to take classes and see patients and I had all these responsibilities, I could barely work out two hours a week, much less two hours a day. And I couldn't get rid of the cravings. I found that these foods had Mm. taken hold of me. It's like they had a mind of their own. And I kept Mm. eating like I was eating. And I got Mm. fatter and fatter. And my triglycerides went through the roof. And I had doctors telling me over the years that I was going to die in my 30s if I didn't figure this out because I had so many cardiovascular risks. Yeah. So you must have been, how fat were you? How how much overweight were you? That's probably a better word. (laughs) Probably about 280. Probably about 280 is where I landed. And um, that's not that bad. Why were they telling you you're going to die of cardiovascular disease? I'm 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 getting the picture like you like 400 pounds. (laughs) Well, I'm my my right weight is around 200 pounds, and I hover around there now because my my cardiovascular profile was very risky and my triglycerides were well over a thousand, if I recall correctly, which is about 10 times where they should be. Okay. And um, every, there's so many people up and down the line in my family that had heart attacks. Mm. So, but that wasn't the worst part okay. of it. The physical parts were bad and I didn't feel good about myself. And by the way, I wasn't always fat, so I would... You know, I went, I went for all of the help you could imagine. I went to the best psychologists and psychiatrists. I took medication. I went to Overeaters Anonymous. And they all helped a little bit. And then it seemed like it made things much worse. So I get better and then I get much worse. And mm. so sometimes I'd be a little thinner and then I wouldn't. Um, what, what eventually I realized was that I was going about things from the wrong perspective. I was trying to love myself thin or heal the hole in my heart so that you know, then I could eliminate the cause of the desire to overeat. I figured it wasn't okay. what I was eating at what was eating me. And, that, and that's what a psychologist would think, right? And I, I come from a family right. of 17. So, so I, um, I eventually realized that was the wrong paradigm. And that it was more to really recover might be more like an alpha wolf dealing with a challenger for leadership. And like if an alpha wolf deals with a challenger for leadership, if another wolf challenges the alpha wolf on the pack, it doesn't say, hey, somebody needs a hug. It says, you know, get back in line or I'll kill you. And there were a bunch mm-hmm. of things that led me to that conclusion that I was going to have to capture and cage a rabid animal more so than love myself back wow. to health. <laughs> I like that analogy. <laughs> Thank you. So one of them was that I had been doing some reading in alternative addiction treatment by a guy named Jack Trimpey, who wrote a book called Rational Recovery. And he made it clear to me for the first time that the seat of addiction was really the reptilian brain. And what I knew about the reptilian brain from my newer anatomy in graduate school and you know, from some of the animal studies that I'd read about addiction was that the reptilian brain doesn't know love. This is really mm. interesting. So we're all, we're all busy trying to love ourselves out of these addictions, but the reptilian brain doesn't know love, and that's what's targeted for, for the addiction itself. It, the reptilian brain assesses something in the environment and says, do I eat, do I eat it? Do I meet with it or do I kill it? Like eat, mm. mate, or kill. 
And there's mm. no love there. There's no concern for tribe or family or um, friends or long-term aspirations or creativity or music or art. There's none of that. It's just eat, mate, or kill. And when you look at the animal studies, you see that what happens when you short circuit, <coughs> excuse me, the pleasure system by, for example, putting an electrode directly in uh, an animal's brain in the pleasure center and letting themselves stimulate, they forget about everything else of importance. They, they, neg they neglect their survival drives, they ignore their survival drives. You could take a starving rat and hook it up to a pleasure lever like that, and it'll press the lever thousands of times a day and ignore its food. Or you could take a nursing mother rat and she'll press the lever thousands of times a day and ignore her pups. That they'll oh. crawl over painful electrical wow. grids. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Some pretty so deep realized, stuff here. Right. <laughs> well, and I don't think that anybody's putting an electrode in our brains. I don't think we're being, you know, kidnapped and operated on in the middle of the night or something like that. But can you make the argument that we're pretty close if you can walk out of a McDonald's in most cities and there's a Burger King across the street. I mean, there's, there's fast food restaurants in every corner these days. And right. they're not physical electrodes, but maybe they're chemical electrodes. They're, they're concentrations of pleasure that we weren't prepared to meet by evolution. And okay. as a consequence, people walk around feeling like, you know, they, they're ignoring what they really need to survive, which are largely fruits and vegetables, right? And how many people mm -hmm. say they don't, like fruits and vegetables anymore. So, so I realized there were very, very powerful forces aligned against us and that I was going to need a much more practical, powerful, aggressive approach to, to fix this. The, the last piece has to do with the um, 40,000 person study that I did, but I don't know if you need to take a break before I do that. No, 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 go ahead. No. <laughs> you so, just started. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all in concert, all in concert around that time, I was also running this multi-year study online. When, when clicks were cheap, I got 40,000 people to take a survey all about the foods that they craved and the things that were bothering them in life. And what I found was that people who struggled with chocolate, and I usually started my binges with chocolate, by the way, so that was definitely... Really? Okay. Mm -hmm they tended to be lonely or brokenhearted. People who struggled with salty, crunchy things tended to be um, stressed at work. People who struggled with soft, chewy things like bread or bagels or pasta, they tended to be stressed at home. And I thought that was really fascinating. Okay. I, got a lot of, I got a lot of press for that, by the way. I got in a lot of magazines and radio shows and things. And I figured that was going to solve the problem or at least lead me halfway there because then you just had to know what someone was struggling with and you could, what, what food they struggled with and you knew what to work on with them psychologically. Well, I started with myself, okay. of course. And I went to talk to my mom. Like I said, I come from a family of 17 psychotherapists. And so my wow. mom... Not only, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the, the standing joke is that if something breaks in the house, nobody, um, nobody knows how to fix it, but everybody knows how to ask it how it feels. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. But anyway, I asked my mom, I said, mom, so, okay, I'm into chocolate. I have trouble with chocolate and I am feeling lonely and brokenhearted. My, my marriage is not that great, but what is it in my upbringing? Like you raised me and you're a therapist. What is it in my upbringing that could have done this? And she says, Glenn, I'm so sorry. I'm so, so sorry. I said, what is it? She says, honey, when you were one year old in 1965, my father, your grandfather, he just got out of prison. And mm. he was guilty. And I adored him. I'd organized my whole life around adoring him. And I just didn't, it's like my whole world fell apart. And I was really, really depressed and shocked. At the same time, your dad, my husband, was a captain in the army and they were talking about sending him to Vietnam. And we were trying mm. to get pregnant. Mm. So I thought wow. I, I could theoretically have two kids and be a single mother. And probably half the time I was just sitting and staring at the wall. I was so depressed and anxious. Mm. 
and I didn't have the wherewithal to hug you and love you and feed you. Wow. So when you, when you came running to me, I would say, honey, go get, go get your Bosco. And there would be a bottle of chocolate Bosco syrup and a refrigerator on the floor. That you know how oh, to open wow. And you That's go powerful. <laughs> wow. Not too many people get that much clarity, um, uh, you know, because they don't have a mother that was, that was able to, um, you know, to say, right. well, I think this is where that came from. Wow. That's pretty good. Well, so Marina, you'd, you'd think that would have fixed the problem, right? But would you believe me if I told you it made it worse? When she told you that? Yeah. Now, because now you have an excuse? Is that it? That's basically it, yeah. It's like there was this voice <laughs> in my head that said... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, you deserve like this chocolate because you were, yes, I hear you, okay? <laughs> You're the first person that guessed that exactly. There's this little yeah, voice so. in my head that said, you know what, Glenn? Your mama left a great big chocolate-sized hole in your heart. <laughs> And until you can find the love of your life, you're going to have to go right on binging. Let's go get some right now. Yippee. Um, <laughs> wow. It was a good conversation to have. It, I learned yeah. more about my mom. I forgave her. I could forgive myself. Clarity. Is that what we need? Yes, you got some clarity, but you're right. Yeah. Um, but your brain still hijacked you. It, it found a way to make you still eat it. <laughs> so that, that was the first yep. time that I said to myself, you know, maybe the emotions aren't the problem. And if you think about it, think of like emotions like a fire. It's okay to have a raging fire in a really good fireplace in your home. It keeps the home warm. It can be the seat of a very romantic evening. It can be the hearth around which the family gathers and converses and, and bonds. It's okay. It's okay to have a big fire. The problem is if there are holes in the fireplace, the fireplace isn't functioning. And I recognized that there was this voice of justification in my head and in the, you know, my patients' heads and the clients that I was talking to and the friends that I was talking to about all this. There's this voice of justification, and what that voice of justification does is it pokes holes in the fireplace, mm. and it makes mm. it possible for that fire to escape and burn down the house, or, mm. you know, i.e., create a binge. Yeah. And so from that point, I decided I was going to have to focus on really identifying when that voice was active, figuring out how I could either ignore it or disempower it. And so here's what I did. This is really embarrassing for a sophisticated guy like me. But um, I decided that that inner voice was going to be my pig. I wish I picked another name for it because people get offended by the fact that I'm like <laughs> but, No, it's a pig. <laughs> Right. Okay. I, Nothing wrong with that. Mm-hmm. And Myrna, I, I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to get up and talk about this. I wasn't going to publish this or write a book. I just wanted to get better. So I decided this is my, this is my pig. Okay. My pig. I would draw a line in the sand and I would say something like, I'll only ever have chocolate on weekends again. I'll never eat chocolate Monday through Friday. And then if I heard a little mm. voice in my head that said, you know, Hey Glenn, you worked out really hard today. You, you deserve a bar of chocolate. It's not going to do any harm. Wow. Or, or, you know, hey, Glenn, chocolate grows on a plant, therefore it's a vegetable. It comes from a cocoa bean, so it's a vegetable. <laughs> but, or the chocolate is, dark chocolate is good for your heart. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Whatever it was. <laughs> and and I, don't, I don't advocate for mm-hmm. or against chocolate for anybody, by the way. But right, whatever right. it would say, I'd say, that's just my pig squealing for pig slop. Chocolate is pig slop. What it's saying is pig squeal. Yep. I don't eat pig yep. slop, and I don't let yep. farm animals tell me what to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you and, know, you're making you we're making fun of the chocolate, but I've heard people do that with drinking that you only drink on the weekends and stuff like that because it's the same kind of thing. It's calling you. So yeah, this this is this is um, a good conversation. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. Well, so it wasn't a miracle. I don't eat pig slop. I don't let farm animals tell me what to do. And I, I wish I could tell you that as soon as I figured out, I just stopped overeating. But what actually happened for me was the, the, the part of it that was a miracle was that I stopped feeling powerless and confused. It would give me a few extra microseconds at the moment of impulse to wake up and think about 
who I was, why I wanted to only have chocolate on the weekends, and whether I wanted to make the right decision or not. And more often than not, I started to make the right decision, and then I always started to make the right decision. And then before I knew it, I just wasn't eating chocolate. And there's, there's another piece of it, which was that I was substituting um, <laughs> kale banana smoothies to try to yeah, figure out what maybe my maybe chocolate and bread or something. <laughs> well, no. Yeah, okay. But, Okay. <laughs> I, tried to figure, I tried to figure out what, what was the authentic desire in nature that I was ignoring. Um, and I recovered. I mean, I, I kept a journal for eight years to do it. Mm-hmm. And it was me versus my pig and all the crazy things that the pig said. But, but I recovered. <laughs> and Wow. And wow. This is, this, this is deep. I mean, you're a psychologist, came from a line of 17, and you still had that problem. What is the, you know, the little, you know, the, 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 the single mother that doesn't have much education? And wow, that sounds like a really hard battle. Well, you know, and I know we're going to get into that, right? Mm-hmm. In some ways, <laughs> a single mother without much education is in a better position because she doesn't have all the psychological theory and knowledge and, you know, okay. all the things to distract her. And I, I was distracted in a lot of ways by everything I knew about psychology. Psychology okay. is great. I mean, I'm, I'm still a psychologist. Psychology is great. You can really help you find your soul and heal your soul. But um, in terms of recovering from, from um, my eating problem, it really wasn't. Oh, okay. All right. So, so I kept that journal for eight years. And then in 2015, I was a minor part of a publishing company. And the CEO asked me if I could write a book because they wanted to do a marketing experiment Mm -hmm. and prove to other authors that we could do really well with it. And I said, well, I have this crazy journal that I kept. And he said, let me read it. I gave it to him. He lost 86 pounds. Oh, wow. From from your journal? Yeah. Oh, wow. So he he decided he had his own pig and he had his own rules. And and before you knew it... um, we had published it and put it on Amazon, and it just took off. We have um, 600,000 readers and almost 2,000 reviews. And um, wow. I, I go around telling people that I don't eat pig slop. I don't let farm animals tell me what to do, and you can do the same thing if you want to. <laughs> that's, that's, that's my life. Now. Wow. Wow, um, uh, you know that is that is good. I want to I want to circle back to um, uh, you know a couple of things before we go on our first break. Um, but I've heard on this show before um, uh, the um, uh, how you know what you crave has something to do with what you're lacking. Um, uh, I think it was said a little differently because I think um, uh, somebody had said that if 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 you're um if it's you're crunching then you're angry but you're saying stress at work um but so is there is there like a um uh, you know where does that come from because obviously you know you know people are you know people are getting the fact that what you're craving for is you know something that you're missing but um you know there there might not be like a specific um, a thing that you know, like a uh, like a, if you go to Wikipedia or something, you're going to see that this is um, uh, you know this is one thing. If you know, so what I'm trying to say is, um, who makes the determination of depending on whatever you're craving that what's lacking? Well, I would put that whole conversation in the category of being extremely intriguing but not necessarily useful for overcoming overeating. <laughs> okay, so, all right. So, so um, you know, I could show you some statistics about the percentage of people that were craving, um, you know, pretzels and chips and the percentage of people mm-hmm. who said that they were overstressed at work. And you'd be impressed with those statistics okay. and you would... Um, Okay. Got you. And, and, Got you. And, and so, and so, like there is some evidence to. That, and this is just one study, and it was methodolo- methodologically flawed. So it really just generates some hypotheses. This is not proof in any right. way, shape, or form. But my question is, well, so what? So now you know that you're stressed at work, and maybe you're taking it out by crunching on some chips. So what? <laughs> mm-hmm. Right. So, so now what we need to do is 
we could either spend the next five to 10 years getting you a better job or starting your own business and getting the man's boot off your neck, or we could make a really simple rule about pretzels and chips and ask yourself, what role do you want them to play in your life? Do you, <clears throat> you want them out of your life entirely? Do you want to have them on weekends? Do you want to have them at major, major mm-hmm. league baseball games or <laughs> Super Bowl parties? Okay. What, what do you want to do? And, yeah. and then use a very yeah, practical instead of making method. an excuse, right, right, exactly. You know, again, you know, with that information, just like you found out about why you ate the chocolate, with that information, people can, you know, say, well, you know, I'm, I'm, it's okay if I uh, eat, you know, I eat this crunchy stuff because I'm stressed at work, and that's how I deal with it. So yeah, I got you. All right. So one last thing, because um, you spent a lot of time talking about the reptilian brain and that it doesn't know love and eat or, eat or kill. Now, how does that relate to, um, you know, somebody that's overeating or binging? You know, give me, the, give me the, you know, the context of that. Well, it's the reptilian brain that's targeted by these food-like substances that's being, that are being engineered. It's our mm-hmm. most basic survival mm-hmm. mechanism most primitive survival mm. mechanism. Okay. And, and basically what the, I'm sure a neurologist would take me to task on this, but what those foods are doing <laughs> is saying, you need us to survive. You don't need your regular fruits and vegetables to survive. And it doesn't have anything to do with love or not love. It, it has to do with, um, it has to do with, you know, some fat cat in a white suit with a mustache that's laughing all the way to the bank when you buy their bars or, Boxes and containers. <laughs> right, exactly. Right, exactly. Got you, got you. All right. Okay, and, and, so and perfect. The, the, <laughs> I was trying to emphasize the idea that it's the most primitive part of ourselves that's being targeted. The good news about that is that the rest of our brain is superior to that, tar- to that target. So our, our neocortex, the, the part of our brain where we really reside or to some extent, the mammalian brain, which is above the reptilian brain, it has the ability to say, look, before you eat, mate, or kill that thing, what impact is this going to have on the people that you love? How is this going to affect your family? How is this going to affect your long-term goals? Got you. Got you. Right. Yeah. Yeah, because we've evolved, you know, higher than the reptilian brain. Got you. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, that was a perfect, beautiful start. <laughs> a lot of good information there. I mean, you set the background very well. So let's take our first break now. And um, when we come back, um, we're going to talk on our topic, which is how to reprogram yourself to think like a permanently thin person. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Do you ever think that you have too much stuff? Maybe two or three of the same item, but don't have the one thing you need or want. Or maybe you spend hours getting ready to host a garage sale, only to have most of the things taken to charity anyway. Perhaps you have a service you'd like to offer in exchange for another service that you need. Or maybe just looking for one specific hard to find item like sports memorabilia or auto parts. Well, BarterUpOnline.com can help you solve all of these problems. Whether you have unwanted items, looking for specific items, or are simply willing to trade services, BarterUpOnline.com is for you. The process is easy. Come to our website, sign up for a monthly account, which will cost you $2 a month, build once a month, or sign up for an annual account, which will cost you $1 a month, build once a year. Next, post as many items as you like on your barter page. Then, sit back and watch our back office help you find the people that are willing to trade. Yes, in no time, potential traders will be shopping on your barter page with no money. Want to tell your friends about your barter page, or maybe you're planning another garage sale? No problem. Simply send out your barter page email flyers or print your barter page business cards right from the website. Finally, a website that helps you trade something you don't want for something that you need, want, or can use. Go on and visit our website today. No money, no problem, only trades. Are you satisfied with your current cable company? Are you paying way more than you should? 
save money on your cable bill each and every month and get more with new media. Five star rated. You can run it new media from your smart TV, tablet, phone, or fire stick with ease. Get over 1,500 HD TV channels, all movie channels, sports packages, and pay for preview events, children's channels, international channels, and videos on demand. All included for only $49.95 a month. Get more content at a lower price. No contract, no credit check, no deposit, equipment or commitment required. Refer five people and get your service absolutely free. Go to don't pay for cable TV dot com. That again, that website again is don't pay for cable TV dot com, which is D O N T P A Y, the number four C A B L E T V dot com, and sign up for a free twenty four hour trial. Try it today. Switch and save. Welcome back to the Transform Your Mind to Transform Your Life radio show and podcast. I'm your host, Coach Myrna Young, and today we are having a very interesting conversation with Dr. Glenn Ludson, the author of Never Binge Again. In our first segment, um, Dr. Glenn took us through the background of his um, um, a journey from obesity and binging on chocolate and set us up with some foundation of why we binge and overeat. But our topic today is um, how can we reprogram ourselves if we, um, if our reptilian brain is calling out for foods that we're not supposed to eat and, um, you know, we have some stresses or we have some, uh, you know, something that we're missing that, um, uh, you know, because it's, everything is all in the mind, which is why this is the Mindset Transformation Show. Um, everything is in the mind. So, um, Dr. Glenn, take us through, maybe using yourself as an example, how um, uh, you can pr- reprogram your mind and uh, think you're permanently thin. And I'm assuming when you're thinking that you're permanently thin is that you um, you don't need food somehow. What's, what's the connection there? Well, um, a little different than that. What, okay, what, right. <laughs> what I tell people, that the best way to get started is to, is to think of the single worst trigger food or eating behavior that's getting you in trouble. Maybe it's eating in the car. Maybe that's where you do all the damage. So maybe you could create one rule that says, I never eat in the car. Or maybe it's a particular food. Maybe, um, you know, maybe I can only have salami on Sundays. Whatever it is, maybe maybe it doesn't have to do with a particular food. Maybe it's about how you eat. Maybe it's more like you need to pause and be more mindful. So you say, I'll always put my fork down between bites. Whatever it is, there's something that you know getting you into trouble. Just start with that one rule. Don't, don't worry if making this rule will help you to lose weight or not. Unless your doctor says that it's really urgent that you do. I just want you to get the hang of the way this mental game is played because what that rule allows you to do is to separate your thoughts from your reptilian brain's thoughts. You're by definition deciding to kind of split your head up into two pieces. There's a piece of you that wants to be good and the piece of you that wants to be bad. Think of the angel and the devil on your shoulder from way back when. All, right. all, your, construct, all your constructive thoughts about food and all your destructive thoughts about food. And a thought is constructive if it will help you to comply with this one rule that you made. And your thoughts are destructive if it would attempt to convince you to do otherwise, to break it. Once you have that, you want to come up with a name for your reptilian brain. Like I said, I call mine my pig, but some people (laughs) call theirs their food monster or their food demon or something like that. Okay. 
And then you want to listen for those destructive thoughts. You want to listen for what your inner food demon says is the rationale that you should break the plan. And you can do one of two things when you hear it. First of all, you can ignore it because it doesn't matter how smart what it's saying is, it doesn't matter how logical it sounds, if you know that it's coming from your food demon, you know the food demon only has one thing in mind and it's bad, and so you might as well ignore it, even if it sounds like it's got a PhD from Harvard. <laughs> if that's difficult for you, then you could write out what the food demon is saying, and you could ask yourself, where is the lie within it? Where is the logical fallacy within it? For example, maybe the food demon says, one bite won't hurt, you can start again tomorrow. Which is based upon the logical fallacy that you'll be in the exact same place tomorrow. But the way Mm -hmm. that our brains work, if you reinforce the connection today between that craving and the actual eating of the food, then you're going to have a stronger craving tomorrow. So the addiction will be a little worse tomorrow than it is today. Mm -hmm. That's why we say if if you're in a hole, you want to stop digging. Right. Or, okay. or maybe the food demon will say, yeah, you can do this for a little while, but you've always failed before, so you're going to fail again. <laughs> All right. Well, I want to interrupt here for a minute because something just popped into my mind. Um, I have heard that if you, if you crave something, then if you deny yourself, it gets stronger, which is basically what we just said. But if you say, you know, um, you deny yourself and tomorrow it's stronger. So is that true? Because what you're um, saying is that you should, you know, tell your food, talk to your food demon and, and say no. Wait, but I'm not telling you to ignore your, bottle, your body's authentic needs. Okay. So it's like this. There are some rules that you can't make because they would restrict your body from getting what it really needed. I can't say I'll never pee again. I can't say I'll never pee again, because my bladder is going to tell me otherwise, right? I have to take care of my Mm -hmm. bladder. But I could say I'm never going to pee in public again. I can only pee in the bathroom. A better analogy might be uh, when I gave up chocolate, I said I would never have chocolate again. I would run to a banana kale smoothie. And at first, I hated them. I thought they tasted like crap. Um, I couldn't imagine why anybody would want this instead of a chocolate bar. But I said, (laughs) it logically makes makes more sense to me that if I'm craving energy, because usually I want to chocolate for energy, that I'm, I'm looking for, you know, natural carbohydrates and maybe chlorophyll and some fiber. And over time, that um, craving was fulfilled. Now, I I didn't get high in the same way that you get high with a chocolate bar. And I I do believe that a lot of these industrial foods get us high. Right. We didn't have, we didn't have chocolate bars in the Savannah. We didn't have, you know, chips and pasta in the tropics. Mm -hmm. These are concentrations of pleasure that our, Mm. our organism didn't evolve to handle. Yes. Okay. And, and so there must have been something else that the body really needed for it to generate that craving. And so I just did my best to use my head to figure out what that would have been. Okay. Um, when I, so I wasn't denying the craving, right? I, I wasn't really denying the craving. I was feeding my body what it needed. Another example would be I used to eat a lot of pasta with Parmesan cheese, lots and lots of cheese, sometimes mozzarella cheese, a lot, a lot of cheese. Okay. Okay. And when I started to move away from that, what I would do is make myself some brown rice with tomato sauce and nutritional yeast instead. And so I, I was just substituting a healthier version of the mm. taste and texture that I really okay. wanted. Okay. That, that makes sense. That makes sense. I know um, some people also say that you should have a binge day or a, a day where you eat everything you want. So it kind of it nullifies those cravings. So there's a lot of ways around it, but I'm getting what you're saying. Yes. Um, all right. Some people, do, some people do well with that. Some people don't. Okay. Some people make a set of rules, <laughs> and then they say, yeah, but on right. Saturdays, all bets are off. And it, and right. it works really right. well for them, like a safety valve. Other people, if they have that safety valve, it, they just can't seem to get back yeah. on it Sunday. 
Yeah. Yeah. I understand because to me um personally is that yeah that um the more you more you more you get something you like the more you want it. <laughs> so when you're when you're saying that okay on Saturday I'm going to binge then on Tuesday your body's going to call for it. You know, that's what I'm yeah, so got you. Got you. All right. So <clears throat> so what you're saying if I'm understanding it correctly in order to think like a permanently thin person um, uh, you just got to um, separate your brain into the good or the bad, and when you get the 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 the, the bad thoughts, you kind of um, replace them with a, a healthier version. Is is is, is yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. Per- permanently okay. thin people recognize the thinking patterns that lead them to overeat, and okay. they they recognize and um, and distance themselves from them the moment that they begin to go down that road. Okay. And th- this is a very simple mental technique to begin to do that. Okay. What, this also allows you, what this also allows you to do is to purge the doubt and insecurity from your mind. Most, most people walk around terrified that they can't stick with any role. They, they remember all the times that they failed in the past, so they think they're going to fail in the future. And mm-hmm. they, they don't know yeah. that that's their inner pig or their inner food demon um, really wanting to fail in the future. And they don't have a method for purging those doubts from their mind. And then those doubts really drain their energy. And so they can't focus their energy on the goal. And as a consequence, they don't do as well. Mm. Okay. Yeah, all right. Well, that makes sense. You know, it's all in the mind, and overeating definitely is is in the mind. So it's a, a great conversation for this show. Now, I also understand, um, you know, from your bio, that um, one of the ways to um, attack this as well is that to create a food plan, and the food plan would have some things that you never eat. Sometimes you eat seldomly and things like that. So talk to us about how you would go ahead um, creating a food plan and, um, you know, the categories of this food plan and things like that? Well, so I recommend people start with that one rule and live with it for a couple of weeks at least until they really feel okay. confident that, th- that this is something they can do. And don't worry about losing weight unless the doctor says it's an emergency. Just, just get started structuring your mind like this. And then you can add some additional rules. A food plan is a set of food rules. That's all a food plan is. Add some additional rules to help you with the other trigger foods or behaviors and perhaps to limit the volume or calories if you really need to lose weight. Make make sure that you're not uh, running at a deficit that would cause you to lose more than a pound or two per week. um, That actually keeps you in the feast and famine cycle. And most people who struggle with overeating don't recognize that they're addicted not just to overeating but to dieting also. The mm. whole feast and famine cycle. What feast and famine have in common is that they're both perceived as a state of emergency by the body. It's like, oh my God, most of the time there's not enough calories and nutrition available, but now there is, so we better hoard them. And that's why people mm. go back and forth between dieting and binging. Okay. So... Yeah, and then you can make up whatever rules you want to. The criteria are that they, they need to be objectively verifiable. So if 10 people followed you around all month, they'd all agree whether you followed them or not. Whatever objectively verifiable rules you can come up with could function as a food rule. As a guideline, I suggest to people that they consider things that they would always like to do. Like I always have five servings of fruit or vegetables or... I always write down a hypothetical food plan before I go to bed for the next day, or you know, I, I always drink two whole glasses of water when I get up in the morning. Things that they'll never do, things that they'll do on, only under certain conditions, like only eat pretzels at major league baseball games, and <laughs> things that they can do in an unrestricted way so that you don't ever worry that you're going to starve. And b- by the way, I've created some starter templates, which you can have for free. Um, I'll tell you where to get them at the end. And the okay. starter templates have, have sets of rules that would be appropriate for different dietary philosophies. So whether you're you know, ketogenic or macrobiotic or point counter or calorie counter or high carb or low carb, it, it doesn't matter. We came up with a set of starter rules that you can customize to make your own. Okay. 
All right. So you went over that stuff pretty fast. So um, so you've got the the things that you always like you want to do, like eat fruits and vegetables and drink water, or whatever. And then we have stuff like we never do. Um, uh, I guess ice cream, chocolate, whatever. Um, and I don't understand the conditions and the unrestricted. Well, c- conditionals are things that you will allow yourself to do sometimes. So okay. mm-hmm. rather than purging chocolate from your life entirely, maybe you want to say, I will allow myself to have two squares of you know, 70% or better dark chocolate every calendar day. Or maybe you say, I don't eat bread except when I'm out at a restaurant, I can have two slices. Got you. Something Got like you. that. All that's, right. a, that's a conditional. Okay. And unrest- I suggested that people consider the unrestricted category. For example, I can have as many leaf and green vegetables as I want to as long as there's no salad dressing on them so that you know there's always something you can put in your mouth if you need to. Mm. Okay. Got you. All right. You can eat as much as you want, right? Yes. Okay. So that's good. And um, I, I see that working. Because I think that's a, that's a good plan. It's um, you know something that you can you know people can actually stick to, because again, it's not um, they are you know saying to themselves where um, nothing is off the table. I can eat it sometimes, you know, um, like me. You know, I I'm one of the people that that rarely eat bread unless I go to a restaurant and then I, I eat the whole roll. <laughs> but you know, um, so that's like my sometimes thing. But I, I, I get you or beer because you know, beer makes me gain weight, and I love beer. So I, 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 I that's definitely my conditional. Um, so I'm understanding what you're saying, and I, and I think that 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 can work. You know, um, uh, yeah. So so that's awesome. All right, so um, uh, let's take our um, second break, and then we're going to come back and. Um, Dr. Glenn is going to um, tell us how you can, you know, um, get a hold of his book and and um, get some of these uh, starter plans. So um, sure. remember to support the advertisers that um, support the show. So um, uh, listen to a word from our sponsors, and we'll be right back. Do you ever think that you have too much stuff, maybe two or three of the same item, but don't have the one thing you need or want? Or maybe you spend hours getting ready to host a garage sale, only to have most of the things taken to charity anyway. Perhaps you have a service you'd like to offer in exchange for another service that you need. Or maybe just looking for one specific hard to find item like sports memorabilia or auto parts. Well, BarterOffOnline.com can help you solve all of these problems. Whether you have unwanted items, looking for specific items, or are simply willing to trade services, BarterOffOnline.com is for you. The process is easy. Come to our website, Sign up for a monthly account, which will cost you $2 a month, billed once a month, or sign up for an annual account, which will cost you $1 a month, billed once a year. Next, post as many items as you like on your barter page. Then, sit back and watch our back office help you find the people that are willing to trade. Yes, in no time, potential traders will be shopping on your barter page with no money. Want to tell your friends about your barter page, or maybe you're planning another garage sale? No problem. Simply send out your barter page email flyers or print your barter page business cards right from the website. Finally, a website that helps you trade something you don't want for something that you need, want, or can use. Go on and visit our website today. No money, no problem. Only trades. Are you satisfied with your current cable company? Are you paying way more than you should? Save money on your cable bill each and every month and get more with New Media. Five star rated. You can run New Media from your smart TV, tablet, phone, or Fire Stick with ease. Get over 1,500 HDTV channels, all movie channels, sports packages, and pay-per-view events, children's channels, international channels, and videos on demand. 
all included for only $49.95 a month. Get more content at a lower price. No contract, no credit check, no deposit, equipment or commitment required. Refer five people and get your service absolutely free. Go to don'tpayforcabletv.com. That again, that website again is don't pay for cable tv.com, which is D O N T P A Y, the number four C A B L E T V.com, and sign up for a free 24 hour trial. Try it today. Switch and save. Welcome back to the Transform Your Mind to Transform Your Life Radio Show and Podcast. I'm your host, Coach Myrna Young, and today we have been talking to Glenn Livingston, Ph.D., author of Never Binge Again, and we've had a very interesting conversation um, talking a lot about the psychology of binging and um, overeating. Now, as we wrap our show, um, uh, we want to talk to ask Dr. Glenn how um, someone that you know has a, um, a condition where they're overeating, whether they're um, uh, you know addicted to certain foods. Um, we didn't talk about um, some of the over you know the diseases like bulimic, um, but um, so as we wrap up, so Dr. Glenn, tell us about your starter, um, uh, your starter plan. And also where, um, uh, you know, any of the listeners can get a hold of you and your book um, so that they can get some more information on this. The, the best place to start is with all our free stuff. And you can get that at neverbingeagain.com by clicking the big red button and signing up for the reader bonuses. What you'll get when you do that, among other things, is a copy of the book in Kindle, Nook, or PDF format. Uh, you, can, you can get an electronic copy of it for free. If you want the physical copy, there is a place you can do that, but um, it costs a little something. Same with the Audible copy. And okay. for free, you'll also get the Food Plan Starter Templates that we talked about. And you'll also get a whole bunch of recorded coaching sessions so that you can hear how this process transforms people from feeling powerless and despairing and hopeless about food to feeling um, hopeful and powerful and in control. It's all at neverbingeagain.com. Click, click the big red button. Thanks. <laughs> All right. So that's awesome. And that's very easy to um, remember as well. Um, Neverbingeagain.com. Um, a lot of um, free information on there. And um, so you, you said that you there's some coaching um, uh, videos on there. So do you um, offer coaching sessions as well? Like paid oh, we coaching sessions? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. My private sessions are kind of expensive, but I've got uh, a group package that's very affordable. And okay. you'll be led to that if you get onto that reader bonus list. Or you can also okay. go to neverbingeagaincoaching.com. Perfect, 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 perfect. All right, so this has been very informative for uh, me. Um, I want to thank um, uh, Dr. Livingston for um, being very um, uh, going very much in depth to um, the psychological reasons that we overeat and binge. Um, so that was good information. We all know that um, what stood out to me is that um, when it, you were being, um, uh, you know, like your reptilian brain, uh, when it's, it's, it's zoomed in on the pleasure of eating, you know, that Big Mac that has a thousand calories, or <laughs> or chips, or ice cream, or beer, or one of the other things that you like that you know that's bad for you, then um, you've got to make some better decisions or um, interrupt that pattern and um, you know choose something that is um, a little better that by maybe still feed your pleasure but is a little better. So that's all great. So um, thank you, um, uh, Dr. Glenn, for um, uh, giving us that um, much in-depth um, start to understanding. 
and yeah, please go check out um, neverbingeagain.com to um, for follow up to this, so that you can um, get some some more information. All right, I um, I want to let you know that, like I said, this is the third installment to our Health Is Wealth series, and um, uh, next week. Um, we are going. I'm going to be interviewing um, Dr. Stephen Lewis, and we're going to be talking about how nutritional supplements um, help you with your on this topic of health as well. So, um, if you've missed any of the, you know, previous episodes, then you can head over to my blog, which is blog.myhelps.us. You'll also get links to all our guests. Um, so um, uh, there will be a link to Dr. Glenn's website, Never Binge Again, and all the other guests that has um, special, um, uh, you know, gifts or information for you. So the blog, you can do that. You can also, you know, download the audio um, either on the blog or on, um, uh, you know, on lots of uh, lots of podcast players iTunes, TuneIn Radio, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Google Play, Spotify, Podbean, SoundCloud, Dexter, CastBox, and them all. So um, I hope you've learned something today <clears throat> from um, talking about overeating and binging. And even if you don't, um, you don't have like a bulimic disease or anything like that, we are all can find some food that we eat when we know we shouldn't eat it. So I hope that, um, you know, everybody listening had at least one aha moment. Um, Dr. Glenn, do you have any last words before we wrap up? Oh, I just wanted to say this was not designed for bulimia um, because you mentioned that a few times. Some people use it for that, but it's um, it's actually offered as training and education, not as treatment because it's not necessarily in concert with the best practices in my profession. So I just want to make that clear. Okay, well, that's good. I mean, the bulimia is the only, um, you know, food disease that I know or, you know, whatever. It might not be called a disease, but that's the only one that I know. So I thought, and that's one of the ones where you binge eat and then you throw up. So, you know, it's, it's, um, I, I, that's why I made the connection. But good that you, um, you clarified that. So, all right. So um, uh, thank you again for um, tuning in to the Transform Your Mind to Transform Your Life radio show, and thank you, Dr. Um, Dr. Glenn. So until next time, um, namaste.